Okay, we're live. So I asked you the question, what is the source of all new alleles? I'm going to lock you out and show responses. Uh, what's an you know, if you know how to spell allele, you probably know what it is. I'm just assuming because it's kind of a funny word. But definitely mutations, alternative forms of a gene. I don't know. Mutations. <laughs> IDK is, is a solid answer. That's true. I don't know. I don't know what that is. That's like. Is that the Kardashian font? What is that? Is this stupid or what? Okay. So yes, of course. Uh, oh no. Is that Marcus? All right. So let's get started, you guys. So today we're going to be looking at how we can alter alleles. And I, I kind of wanted you to get thinking about different versions of a gene. You guys, if we screw up our DNA, we have the wrong codes, the wrong codons on RNA, okay? And if we have the wrong codes on RNA, sometimes we can get the wrong amino acids. And if we get the wrong amino acids, we get a different polypeptide. And if we get a different polypeptide, well, sometimes they don't function, meaning our proteins don't function the way they're supposed to be. And so often mutations don't show up until there's several mutations, and there's a really big mistake. So in genetics, a mutation is basically a change in the structure or amount of the genetic material in our organism. So if I change the DNA, the base model for who we are, that's a mutation. So a genetic mutation or mutant is an individual whose DNA or chromosomes are different from some previous or normal state. When I say normal, it's kind of said uh, tongue in cheek a little bit because our DNA changes all the time, okay? And every time you make a new cell, there is a small mutation in <coughs> that division, okay? And, and a lot of times it's no big deal. Usually it's no big deal, I should say. Usually it's normal. And for the most part, genetic differences among organisms originate as some kind of genetic mutation. Again, the source of all new alleles is mutations. Otherwise, we'd just be trading the same baseball cards over and over and over again, generation after generation after generation. Baseball cards meaning alleles, right? So if we never had the ability to make new alleles, we would have the same deck of cards from the beginning of time, which is kind of would be really boring, right? We wouldn't have cool fossils to look at of dinosaurs that are way different than what we are today. So every unique allele of every gene began as a mutation of an existing gene. If we're petting our neighbor, we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. I'm just saying. <coughs> Get focused. So me, that's on YouTube, me telling the student to not pet their neighbor. Just for the record, it was a girl petting another girl's hair. So if anybody's listening to this, it wasn't like a weird thing. But it was a little weird during lecture, right? Okay. Oh, I'm not. I'm not. Yeah, it's always on YouTube. So mutations occur naturally as accidental changes to DNA or chromosomes during the cell cycle. I want to see how good you guys are. Who can list the stages of the cell cycle? I will give you a hint. Okay? There are five of them. More depending on how you break them down. Please list the stages of the cell cycle. Just the abbreviations are fine. See what you guys remember from biology. You got that? All right, now we're talking. <laughs> I like nerd. I like nerd answers. They're usually right. You broke it down. You forgot one, Mr. Roy. I'm really disappointed. It could exist, but doesn't always. 
You should have it in print. You should have it like after G1 or anything, just in case it, you don't move beyond that point. The G0 resting. Uh, no, it would be after it grows, right? You better put in parentheses because it doesn't always happen. <laughs> it's like nerve cells and muscle cells. Let's see what you guys came up with. Locking you out in five, four, three, two, one. Let's see what we learned last year. And I'm going to lock you out right about, better hit enter, over and right now. Did you send it? All right. So S1, okay, S1, G2, you got the order right. We'll talk more about that. Looks like somebody bailed on their answer. G1, S, G2, mitosis and cytokinesis. It looks good. I like that. G1, S, G2, mitosis, cytokinesis, stay trippy, super, tri is that trippy, is that trippy gang? Yeah. Oh, good Lord. Did I ever tell you about the time I chased trippy gang down the hallway? Yeah. I didn't chase him, he ran. <laughs> no, I am not telling that story on YouTube. No, no. No, 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 not on YouTube. All right, so, <laughs> so I, I will tell it later. So, yes, you got the order. Well, I don't know where P, P1, P2, I don't know what that is. Uh, okay, you got the, you got three steps of mitosis there. All right, yeah. Interphase, well, okay, yeah, these, you start, you end interphase, then you go through your um, mitosis, which is prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. And then, yes, you go through cytokinesis, and that's you, this is actually the three stages of interphase, right? G1, S, G2. Okay. Awesome. I like this one because it's got G0. Remember, if you don't finish G, if you get done with G1 and you're like a nerve cell and you don't need to divide, right, it, or a muscle cell, you go into this G0, this resting stage. Did it? Awesome. Okay. Yeah, awesome. This could just keep going, right? You just write forever. All right. All right. So you get the idea. Now, we're going to be talking a lot about mistakes and, you know, which cells you can have mistakes in and have it not matter and which ones it's, like, detrimental to your future generation. But enzymes are going to be able to repair most DNA that is mismatched during replication but rarely, some DNA is not repaired. Let me see if you remember the enzyme. Which enzyme fixes mistakes in DNA? We just took a test over it. I can give you in five, four... Three, two, you know it or you don't. Here we go. Oh, I locked you out. Sorry. Oh, all right. There you go. All right. What is it? DNA. Put, I can fix that. Oh, a guy from Holes? Yeah. I watched the movie Holes. I don't remember that line. No, I, I remember the movie, but I don't remember that line. Oh, I got you now with the school teacher. Okay. Yep. All right. All right. I'm with you. All right. Good job. You guys understand that we do have an enzyme there that can fix mistakes. So this chapter is talking about mistakes but not the ones that get fixed. What happens when they don't get fixed is what we're kind of here to, to discuss. So the rate of mutation can increase by some environmental factors. Such factors are called mutagens, and these include many forms of radiation and some kinds of chemicals. List some mutagens for me just for fun. Go ahead. List some mutagens. 
do not write Donatello, Michelangelo, Leonardo. Those are Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Oh, come on. <laughs> oh, yes, I knew that was coming. Name some mutagens, not the mutant turtles or Superman or the whole. UV light for sure, like the tanning bed, right? Okay. Wolverine, oh my, it got weird now, okay. You guys are not taking this serious. How about drugs, alcohol, meth, um, uh, tanning beds, McDonald's, Diet Cokes, what else is out there? Apparently, oh, we're, I'm supposed to refer you to Mr. Batcha Galupo if you talk about that. Life. UV light. I, okay, so obviously chemicals in the environment, you guys understand that, but a lot of different things cause mutations. We're talking uh, chemicals for sure, especially drugs and alcohol. Uh, smoking is a big one. Tobacco is a huge one, right? Um, do you guys know where, where a lot of tobacco is grown? Because I see kids, as I'm pulling out of my school, I see kids that I have in class sometimes like with smoke coming out of their car. Like, what are they doing there? But I think I have a pretty good idea. But but it's not an exo interior exhaust pipe. That's not the way it works. Okay, so all that tobacco is grown in countries that don't have, like, laws about spraying stuff on their tobacco plants like we do. Some places are still using, like, DDT. And so when you light that on fire, it becomes, like, a thousand different chemicals. And that's why smoking causes cancer. It, it, it's got so many different, they're called teratogens or mutagens in them, okay, or carcinogens. So because of the way the DNA is translated, and you guys remember the process of tra transcription to translation, a mutation can have many possible effects. A small change in DNA may affect just one amino acid in the protein that results from a gene. Sometimes one amino acid is enough to disturb things, not often. And a mutation may have no effect or may harm or help you in some way. So a lot of mutations happen, but they don't really change the order of amino acid. Or if they do, it's one of like, let's say, 10,000, and that's not a big deal. It's like having one brick missing from a building. The building is still going to function. Or if I exchange a yellow brick for a blue brick in a blue brick building, I've never seen one, but that's what popped in my head. And so if that happened, the building would still function, right? And we wouldn't worry about it. But sometimes if you pull out, let's say, the middle part of the St. Louis arch, what happens if you pull out the key of an arch? It probably falls down, right? So sometimes the amino acids that it disrupts are very um, structurally important to that protein or polypeptide. So the effect depends on where and when the mutation occurs. And mutations are noticed when they cause an unusual trait or disease such as sickle cell anemia. That's when your red blood cells are, sh are shaped like a half moon and they don't carry oxygen very well. And many mutations go unnoticed. <laughs> Some are very noticeable. Does anybody know the type of cell where it's okay to have a mutation at? What type of cell is it okay to have a mutation because it's only going to affect you and not your children? <laughs> What type of cell is it okay to have a mutation in because it will only disrupt you? What do we call those types of cells that only affect the individual and not their future generations? What are those cells called? Now I'm really dragging on some knowledge from biology. <laughs> Thanks for being brutally honest. Yes, you can go. In five, don't say that, you're on YouTube. <laughs> Play it for him later. Four, three, two, one. Oh, blood cell, oh. That's cheap, that's cheap. Blood cells. Ah, I like that one, somatic. Back to yourself. So, let's talk about the word somatic, because we're going to be bringing it up from time to time. I must have missed something. 
I, I can't right now because I froze the screen. So what's the first part of that word? Soma. soma. And in Latin, soma means means body. Okay. So when I when I say the word somatic, it means a body cell. Now when I say the word sex cell, that's different, right? Okay. These are the two basic types of cells in your body. You're either a body cell or you're a sex cell. Those are like the two major categories. If you're a body cell and you mutate, that's bad because you could have cancer, but you don't pass that cancer on to your child because you pass your genes on through sex cells, right, sperm and egg, gametes. Okay? You do not pass them on with skin cells. Okay? I mean, it's a good thing because everybody like, you know, gives high fives all the time. I know it's a bad joke. Yeah. Think about it, it makes sense. Right. So DNA and chromosomes are involved in many processes, so there are many kinds of mutations out there. Most mutations involve a misplacement of a nucleotide in a DNA segment. If I misplace a nucleotide, I will change the codon. If I change the codon, that changes the anticodon. If I change the anticodon, it can but not always will change the amino acid in my polypeptide or protein. It is a domino effect. So most mutations involve a misplacement, and a mutation may change the result of a gene when, it, when the gene is translated and transcribed. Well, transcribed and translated. But not all mutations do so. Why? Because there is more than one amino, I'm sorry, there's more than one codon for each amino acid. Remember, remember there are 64 codons and only 20 amino acids. So different kinds of, mu of mutations are recognized as either changes in DNA or changes in the results of genes. If I gave you a choice, would you rather have a mutation in your DNA or a mutation in your RNA? If I gave you a choice, would you rather have a mutation in your DNA or one in your RNA? And in five, four, point three letters, two, three, two, one. Here it comes. Would it be the same? We'll talk about that. I like it. Okay, everybody put RNA. Here's one. And I heard, wouldn't it be the same either way? Well, no. So we copy DNA, right, onto RNA. Don't worry about the types and all that. And then from that, we bring together amino acids to make proteins. So if I have a mistake in DNA, I will always have the wrong protein, right? Or it won't be perfect. But if I have the, let's say I have bad RNA, can I always make more RNA later? Yeah, because yeah. RNA has a shelf life. It's being used, right? It's going to get wore out. So if you make a mistake once in copying DNA, it's no big deal. But if your DNA gets mutated, very big deal, okay? Because you can't go back and, well, <clears throat> you can fix a little bit of DNA, but if you don't catch it when you're, doing, when you're dividing, it's there forever. So during DNA replication, the wrong nucleotide may be paired or placed in a sequence. Now, a point mutation... Just think of a pinpoint, very small mutation. There's a change of a single nucleotide in the sequence from one kind of base to another. So changing like a G to a C in my order. That'll disrupt things, but usually not in a very large way. Rarely errors in replication cause the insertion or deletion of one or more nucleotides in the sequence. But if I were to delete a G, just take it right out, and everything shifted over. And let's say I was at the third codon and I have a 1,000 after it, would that change every codon after it? Yes. That's a big deal. Okay? Let me ask you this, and I won't make you type this, but just think about this. Very early in, let's say, a pregnancy, let's say I have a mistake in a sperm cell, and there's a deletion there, and it's, let's say it's a pretty big deletion, and it shifts at the very beginning of my genetic code, everything to the left, and every single codon after it is not correct for a human being. 
Will that result in a pregnancy? What do you guys think? No. Usually massive mutations like that do not turn out, okay? It can cause, that's what a lot of miscarriages are. It's a good question, okay? A lot of them are just normal. Like, um, out of, let's say, the 4 million sperm that a male makes in, like, a 24-hour period, well, four days, really, but don't worry about that. Um, just imagine how many mistakes there are in there, right? And there is going to be some deletions in there. And, and eggs the same way, like 400,000 eggs, whatever is involved between 100 and 400,000 eggs. Okay, you're going to have mistakes in there. And so, you know, I can even think about my own experiences, you know, of, of trying to have children. You know, my wife did have a couple of miscarriages, and that's normal. Perfectly normal. Is that with so many pregnant, like, yeah. Yeah. Yep. And it's it's not normal all the time, obviously, but it is a normal part of life, right? So let's keep moving, guys. Changes in a DNA sequence may affect the results of genes in many different ways. A mutation is silent when it has no effect on a gene's function. That doesn't mean it's not there. And that also does not mean that it's driving this thing called microevolution behind the scenes, slowly changing who we are as an organism. Because these silent mutations is how we get different silent variations that will show up in future generations. When I say future generations, I mean like after a few thousand. Start to develop new alleles. Remember, the source of all new alleles is mutations. Now, point mutations are often silent because the genetic code is redundant. And each amino acid has multiple codons. Remember. There are 64 different codons, right, 64 codons, and only 20 uh, amino acids. I've said that a few times. You should probably know that. Remember that chart that you had to read on that last test of all the different co 20 codons, and then there were all, there were 64, I'm sorry, all the different amino acids, then there were 64 different codons that could have resulted in those. Now, a missense or a replacement mutation results when a codon is changed such uh, that a new codon codes for a different amino acid. So if we do get a different amino acid, we say it's a missense. So if it does not change the amino, amino acid, it is a silent mutation. If it does, it is called a missense because it doesn't make sense. It misses sense. Now, the reading frame of a sequence depends on the starting point for reading. An insertion or deletion can shift the reading frame or cause a frame shift. And I mentioned that. If you shift or delete something and shift all of your amino acids to the left, that's a bad deal. What if I insert one that doesn't belong there and everything shifts to the right? Same, same type of deal, right? What if I never coded for a stop codon at the end of my sequence? What if it changed that and I just kept going forever? That can happen, right? Or what if I stop too early? Then I wouldn't have that protein, right? That would be bad. So in frame shift mutations, the remaining sequence may be read as different codons and generally are. Now a nonsense mutation results when a codon is changed to a stop signal. And in this case, the resulting string of an amino acid may be cut short, and the, and the protein may fail to function. So if you shift everything, and all of a sudden you read a stop codon when you were supposed to keep putting amino acids in sequence and forming more peptide bonds, that's a problem. Stop too soon, you get like, let's say, a third of your protein or polypeptide complete, that's not going to function. It's like one wall of a building. doesn't work. Now, if an insertion or deletion has a multiple of three, the reading frame will be preserved. So if you somehow delete exactly three or six or nine, sometimes it's okay because that knocks out just those codons and the rest of them will still code for the correct amino acids. Sometimes that's okay. Now if an insertion or deletion, again, oh, I just read the same thing. An insertion or deletion of many codons is likely to, to disrupt the resulting protein structure and function. So usually, these two things, insertions and deletions, cause frame shifts and are extremely disruptive, usually. You're usually not lucky enough to get them in exact multiples of three. So these are the ones we've talked about. 
If no mutation occurs, I would get methionine, proline, and serine. Yay, the correct amino acid primary sequence of this polypeptide or protein. Okay. This would be the DNA strand that it came from. Now, if I have a point mutation, okay, in this case, I look back and I go, I was supposed to have an A. Now I have a T, but CCT codes for proline, and so does CCA. So there's two different codons for the same amino acid. We call that a silent mutation, meaning it is a mutation, but it's silent because it still codes for the same amino acid. Well, if I replace, in this case down here, the A, okay, or the C with an A, CAA now codes for glycine. That's not good because it was supposed to be proline. That's called a missense mutation. Again, just disrupting one single amino acid. But let's say I have an insertion, okay, and I frame shift everything over to the right. Okay, can you see how inserting this G right here? shifts everything over this way. When that happens and everything shifts over, methionine's right, but every single codon after that, GCC codes for alanine, ATC codes for isoleucine. So every one after this is going to be wrong. It's going to be incorrect. So that's a frame shift. Same thing happens if I delete one and knock it out. Okay? It'll shift to the left instead, screwing everything up. Any questions on these? What questions do you guys have about mutations? Let me see what you guys come on. You guys have any questions? Any questions? Oops, better not lock you out, right? It'll unlock in a minute. Oh, Michelle, sorry about that. What questions do you have about mutations? Real questions. Don't ask me about superheroes. No question. Okay. <coughs> Since I have two responses, I only see one. Uh, it's being a midget. Um, I don't know if that's politically correct, but um, can I talk about dwarfism rather than, because short, short people or little people, that is a series of mutations, yes, in the past, but now um, not considered a disorder, but still from mutations for sure, yes. But it was done in such a way where it, it didn't disrupt them living. Uh, the problem with little people is their bodies are small, but their organs are the same size as, let's say, a full-grown adult. And that's a problem when you have, like, enlarged hearts and things like that. You try to fit everything, these big organs inside of a little body. So generally their lifespan is not as long. Now, when I look at something like dwarfism, dwarfism is different. You guys have heard of dwarfs. Um, I know we all think of, like, movies and whatever. But dwarfism is a real disease. That's where you don't make any human growth hormone, and that can be caused from a mutation in growth hormone. So uh, you guys have probably heard of HGH, Barry Bonds, Sammy Sosa. No? They take that stuff, baseball players, generally professional ones. That's how they break, break all the home run records. No? Let's stay with dwarfs, okay, because dwarfism is a disease, and I'll, I'll talk about that. That's when you don't get any human growth hormone after a certain age. Now, and that's from a mutation, okay? There's the opposite of that where you never turn that gene off. That's called acromegaly. That's like Andre the Giant and Abe Lincoln had that, okay? Um, that's bad because your organs keep growing your whole life, too. You, know, you don't, you can only grow so tall, but... You get enlarged hearts, your organs keep growing, your ears keep growing, your nose keeps growing. And, I mean, that, those things grow for everybody, your nose and your feet, kind of your whole life, but at an exponential rate when you don't stop producing human growth hormone. You would not want human growth hormone your whole life because it forces you, your body to grow when it's not supposed to. Not just your height and your size and your muscles, but your heart, your organs, your kidneys, your intestines, everything. Okay. Uh, 
No, no, not with acromegaly. Not with acromegaly. Okay, let's see what you guys came up with. Do mutations cause physical changes like disfigured faces, etc.? Um, they can. Yep. Uh, we talked about the Hox genes and the Pax genes. Sometimes you can get extra limbs for mutations in a certain set of genes. That's a bad thing. A lot of those are linked to teratogens, things that cause mutations uh, early on in gene expression, like in the womb. Um, okay, I'm going to ignore the trippy gang one. I talked about that one. I don't know how tall Abe Lincoln was. I'm not a historian. No questions. Uh, do retroviruses target a specific location on the chromosome to avoid disrupting the overall function of the cell? No, it is completely random. They actually shoot for, retroviruses actually write their own DNA into your genome. That's like a, HIV does that, AIDS. So here's something crazy, and it's kind of fun to think about, maybe. You guys listen carefully. There is a lot of viral DNA in our own DNA. You don't use all your DNA. There's a lot of empty space between your genes, and a lot of it codes for <laughs> viral DNA. And it's from our past evolution of being infected with retroviruses who write their DNA into our code. And we don't need it, so we don't transcribe it and use it, but it's still there. So we only use a very small portion of our DNA. And actually, shh, you guys, the longer you've been around, the more of this nonsense stuff you have in your DNA. We'll talk more about the X and Y chromosome later, and why girls, um, the, X, the X chromosome, I should say, has been around a lot longer than the Y chromosome. And when you look at the size, we're going to do a karyotype here, probably starting tomorrow. But when you look at the Y chromosome, it's, uh, it's infinitely smaller than the X chromosome, because females obviously would have had to develop before men on the, pla on the planet. The only way you get a person is from a girl, right? And so the same thing with other organisms, too. When you look at um, other allopatric organisms, like frogs and amphibians, things like that, they don't necessarily need a male to reproduce, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. But they can self-fertilize. And so when you look at male-female, and we're going to look at chromosomes, you're going to notice that the male chromosome is way simpler and has a lot less information on it, because it hasn't been here as long. It hasn't had time to evolve and take in all this extra information. All right. I will check it out. So in eukaryotic cells, the process of meiosis creates the chance of mutations at the chromosomal level. So there's a lot of things that happen in meiosis. I might give an overview of that tomorrow. What is the one thing that happens in meiosis that really mixes things up? What do we call that thing that mixes things up in meiosis? What is, what is that thing called that really mixes things up in meiosis? Boy, you, could, you probably could list three different things here, but I'm going to just see what you come up with. Give me what you got. What mixes things up in meiotic division? Remember, just think of spermatogenesis and oogenesis and the divisions of meiosis and what happens. I'm thinking of Mendel's laws right now. I'm thinking of I'm thinking of trying to get across the road. I'm thinking of being independent. Three, two, one, lock you out. Okay, not a blender. Crossover for sure. That's like the that's the one that usually students mention. Okay, um, no is the answer to that question. But I don't. Telephase. No, by the time you get to telephase, it's all over. It's not gonna happen. Put the lime in the coconut. Okay, crossover, independent assortment, and random close association. <laughs> random assortment of genes. Uh, independent assortment of alleles and crossing over for sure. Okay, my words make no sense to me. They will by the end of the year. Uh, crossing over. Uh, okay, so let's talk about this real quick. And you guys, in 
Okay. If I have, let's say my chromosomes. There's a pair of chromosomes, okay? All right? And there's a pair of chromosomes. So did I say, you guys pay attention. When you make sperm and egg, boys, this happens 4 million times a day. Well, every four days. Um, but every day you get a new set of 4 million because it's constantly going. But girls, this happened a long time ago when you are a little child and you've been carrying these around forever. So actually inside your mom's womb it began. So if I take a look here, and you know that during meiosis things line up side by side. There are two pairs of chromosomes in my model that I've given you here. Okay. <laughs> we know that when they get next to each other, sometimes they trade bits and pieces, right? Okay. Some, so, and I'm just going to make them different than each other. Okay. So they swap pieces. We'll just do this so that they're different. I know I should have used completely different colors, but whatever it happens. So when these cross over, this guy is different, this guy is different, this guy is different, and this guy is different. Those are different chromatids, right? And on one chromatid, there's like thousands of alleles, okay? So now just imagine we, sh we swapped like a random amount of our genetic information with our neighbor, okay? And now I have a completely new set. None of these will be like the other, and every time you cross over and make sperm or egg, this is different, okay? Again. A male will do this through his whole lifetime, four million times a day, and never, ever, ever make the same one twice. Okay? That's how random this is. The other thing I didn't mention, did I say who was supposed to be on the right and who was supposed to be on the left when I drew these? Or did we just draw them? Just drew them. So because we don't say who goes on the left and who goes on the right, that's another amount of independence there. Okay? And then when I start to separate them and I put them into different cells, I don't say who goes in what cell. That's the law of independent assortment. So you've got random assortment, you've got the law of independent assortment, and then you've got crossing over. Well, that's the Mendelian genetics, if you guys remember from biology. That gives you complete randomness when you make your cells. Sex cells. So again, during meiosis, chromosomes pair up and may undergo crossing over, and usually the result is an equal exchange of alleles between homologous chromosomes. Usually. Usually things happen equally, and we, we swap genes perfectly, and we get the ones we didn't have, and everything's happy. But errors in the exchange can cause different types of mutations. These are big ones, you guys. These are called chromosomal mutations. Now we're talking about things like Klinefelter's, we're talking about Down syndrome, okay, caused from having like an extra chromosome or missing a chromosome. Now a deletion occurs when a piece of a chromosome, and this is different than the other deletion. This is a chromosomal deletion. Causes when a piece of a chromosome is lost, completely gone. Now I want you to think about crossing over. What if I was in the middle of taking my arm off and putting it on my neighbor's and he was doing it and he dropped his arm and I didn't get one? And on that arm there were like, let's say, a thousand genes that I, was, I needed and now I didn't have them. Did you guys get that? While we're crossing over, I just, oh, there goes a thousand genes. Crossing over. Okay? So such deletions are usually harmful. I mean, if you're missing a thousand genes, that's a pretty big deal, right? If you're a Levi store, you're like out of business. So a duplication occurs when a piece remains attached to its homologous chromosome after meiosis, and one chromosome will then carry both alleles for each of the genes in that place. So I know I've been kind of yammering at you here for a while, a little bit. So I will, I'll stop here. I, this is a lengthy section. We're going to play around with uh, karyotype tomorrow. Okay. <laughs>